Alrighty, we'll go ahead and get started here in just a couple of minutes. I think a few people are still trickling in. Uh, just a couple of logistics before we do get started. Uh, there is a Q&A attached to the webinar, so feel free to be chatting in your questions throughout the webinar as you have them. I have a colleague on the line who's happy to chat you back the answers to, like, you know, to fill you in. I can also take any answers uh, live towards the end of the webinar if I feel there's any questions that should be addressed for the entire group. Uh, also, if you do have the option for the side-by-side -side view, I do have quite a few uh, metal parts with me here today. I'm in the office for this webinar, so feel free to use that side-by-side -side view. It's the best way to view both you know, the slides as well as all the cool metal parts I'm going to be showing off. Uh, I also have my overhead scope here, which you may have seen me playing with a little bit to show you some parts in some higher detail. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started in just a couple minutes. Let give people a few more minutes to trickle in. Alrighty, let's go ahead and get started. Today we're gonna to be talking about 3DP uh, for education and specifically about the desktop metal products. Uh, quickly, just a little bit about desktop metal. Desktop metal was founded in 2015 with the goal to make 3D printing accessible for engineers and manufacturers. And what I want you to take away from this mission statement is really this idea of accessibility. You know, metal 3D printing had existed you know, in the past, but when desktop metal was founded, it was really with the target to make it accessible accessible for the everyday manufacturer, for the everyday engineer, to really allow them to get their hands on metal 3D printing. Uh, we have four printers today. On the far left, you can see our fiber printer. Uh, that's our composite printer, printing things like carbon fiber, fiberglass, peak, PEC, um, you know, some nylons, uh, really great for those lightweight, very strong components. So we'll be talking about that printer today. We have our studio printer, which is the machine behind me. That's great for those office-friendly prototypes, you know, one-off tooling components, uh, jigs and fixtures, low volume production. It's very, very, very easy, very, very, very office-friendly printer, allowing you to create these very complex metal parts all from the comfort of your office. We have the shop system and the production system. Those are both binder jetting machines. Those really allow you to up, you know, the volume, the, the throughput of your machine. When you want to go from maybe 10 to 15 parts per week to, you know, hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousand parts per week. Uh, you know, you can move to these binder jetting systems that really allow you to scale up that volume. And we'll be talking about, you know, all of these products today because they all play a role in education. Quick agenda, I'll briefly talk about the promise of 3D printing uh, and what that looks like, uh, how that really applies to education. We'll talk a little bit about the challenges uh, of, in the education industry and how, you know, 3D printing helps to alleviate some of those challenges. We'll talk about the studio system, fiber system, binder jetting system, and then I'll briefly touch on generative design. So a little bit about the promise of 3D printing. If you're familiar with 3D printing at all, you've probably heard you know, about rapid prototyping. Probably one of the most common applications for 3D printing is the ability to quickly and rapidly prototype. But with metal 3D printing, we can really take that one step further. We're not just prototyping for form and fit like you would with plastic, but now we can actually functionally test our components. We can put them into this machine that's running under high loading, high heat, corrosion environments to actually tell how our geometry is, is performing. You know, it's not just, does my part fit? It's, does my part fit and how does it perform? Part consolidation. You know, so many parts that are designed for their manufacturing method, not for their specific application. They're not optimized, you know, because it would be too expensive and, and, you know, and too time consuming to optimize those components when, you know, it's much easier to have some simple assembly. You know, so many parts are created in, in a 20 part assembly. They're attached with fasteners and rivets and welding even, you know, rather than just creating as one part because it's cheaper to make those 20 parts separately and then assemble them than it would be to make that entire assembly as one component. But with 3D printing, since it is an additive method, 
it's very pop it's very possible it's very common to be able to consolidate these assemblies into fewer components even you know 100 to 1000 to 1 assemblies even you know we'll talk about a few today where we're able to go from you know multiple different parts that used to have to be assembled down to just one single component uh, complex geometries uh, you know, complex geometries, I, I should mention here, you know, people have been creating complex geometries, you know, since people have started creating parts. But I like to talk about complex geometries in terms of justifiable complex geometries. You know, if I'm designing a part for machining, you know, I'm going to try to make that part as simple as possible to machine. So that way, you know, it's as, it's as inexpensive as possible, the lead time is as short as possible. But with 3D printing, you know, since it's an additive method, it's very possible to incorporate, you know, some of these lightweighting features like you're seeing here. Where, you know, if this part was being produced with traditional methods, those lightweighting features would significantly add to my part cost. It would be significantly more difficult to create that part. But with 3D printing, since it's additive, those features actually reduce part costs. You know, I'm reducing the amount of material that I need to use. I'm reducing the amount of print time it's going to take. You know, so some of these features are now actually justifiable. That I can have a far more complex geometry without significantly raising the, the cost of the part and often actually reducing the cost of the part. So when I'm talking about custom, uh, complex geometries today, generally I'm going to be talking about uh, justifiable complex geometries that, you know, if we were going to be using traditional manufacturing, you just wouldn't be able to justify that geometry. A design customization. You know, since 3D printing uh, doesn't require any tooling, you know, each part can be unique if we need it to be. So, you know, it's very easy for me to upload one part today to the printer. When it finishes tonight, I can modify that design a little bit and print a different one overnight. You know, this allows me to be very, very agile. It can be very specific to my individual customers because, you know, making a different part is as simple as editing the file and uploading it to the printer. A rapid tooling. Tooling is generally some of the most expensive and longest lead time components to create. So the ability to actually print your tooling is something that we're seeing a lot of interest in. You know, so things like extrusion dies, injection mold cores, uh, you know, sheet metal tooling. You know, those parts are generally very expensive. They're almost always produced in low volume. So there's some huge advantages to printing those parts, especially when you're working with some of the harder to machine steels, like an H13 tool steel or, you know, a 4140 steel that have low cutting rates and very high tool wear. Since there is no tooling involved and the, pro and the process is fast, uh, you know, we're now able to do on-demand manufacturing where we're printing parts when and where we need them. You know, rather than having to do these batch lot sizes for casting or, you know, investing in machining fixturing that only makes sense to produce parts in higher volume, we can now just print parts as we need them because it's as simple as just uploading it to the printer and in a couple of days we're ready to install the part. This idea of on-demand manufacturing kind of goes hand in hand with this idea of re-engineering of the supply chain. Uh, this one is going to take a little bit longer to actually happen, but we're seeing that as more and more printers are being deployed around the world, we're starting to see people sending digital files instead of hard goods. So if a part's being designed in the United States where I'm located and then they need that part in, you know, say Australia, rather than finding a place to make that part, finding a, you know, a manufacturer to ship it, it's very, it's much easier for me just to send the file via email. They print it on site there in Australia. This is especially true of companies that have global offices where, you know, you know, someone like General Electric or a, a large conglomerate that has, has offices all over the globe, where they have printers all over the globe, rather than having to ship these parts, these actual hard goods and worry about the logistics of that, they can just send their files from office to office and print it on site. Again, you know, this will take some time to happen as more and more printers are being deployed, but we're starting to get there. So what are some of the challenges in the education industry? Low volume production is a, is a challenge we really see across the board in almost every industry, but I think it's quite, you know, it's especially true in education. Almost all parts that are being produced at a university or a high school or, you know, even, you know, up through graduate school are almost always produced in low volume. You know, so this means that, you know, we're working on a project. I know in my undergraduate, I studied mechanical engineering and, you know, the projects that I was working on, were al we almost always only needed one of the part we were creating. This meant that, you know, these mass production methods that require hard tooling, casting, injection molding for plastic parts, forging, stamping, you know, none of those manufacturing methods were possible. We were pretty much exclusive to machining and with our, with our, you know, relatively basic knowledge, we were pretty much exclusive to very simple machining parts. So that kind of goes head in hand with this producing complex geometries, you know, parts that are going to require multiple different machining setups, maybe five axis mills, they often just can't be justified. Uh, you know, they generally have to be have to be redesigned. They have to be sent out because it's just the, above the knowledge of the students at the university. So, you know, many of these desired parts that are required, actually, they have to be sent 
offsite, or they have to utilize some outside resources. Iterating on parts. You know, generally classes are only, you know, six, six months, uh, you know, to be for your entire semester for your project. So it's often not possible to do many design iterations because it's hard enough just to produce one iteration of your, of your, you know, of your design. But, you know, with 3D printing, since there's no tooling involved, it's a, it's, there's no operator burden involved, I can print four different iterations of the same part on one printer, on one print bed. You know, this allows me to try four different iterations. I can produce those four different iterations in just a few days, you know, greatly de decreasing the manufacturing lead time, allowing me to actually do some of this design iteration. Machine shop bottlenecks. You know, campuses only have a, a limited number of machines. I know when I was an undergraduate, it, you know, you'd have to get up very early. You'd have to get, get in line for the machine shop in the morning so that way you could get on a mill or a lathe. You know, so with so many students, it's, it's, it's difficult. You're going to have these machine shop bottlenecks. So it's, it's great to add another resource to your university or your, your high school even to allow, you know, you to be printing parts overnight, over the weekend. There's no operator burden. So this machine can run around the clock and is very easy to set up. So how does additive manufacturing solve, you know, some of these challenges I talked about? I think I already started to touch on these. But, you know, with low volume production, there's no tooling required. You know, part cost is going to stay the same no matter how many parts you need. So this means, you know, for these low volume projects, you know, we can, we can print these more complex geometries. We can, print, we can print geometries even that would require a master level machinist knowledge, you know, very, very easily. I could teach anyone on this call how to print this, you know, very complex oil and gas impeller in just 30 to 40 minutes. You know, it allows you to create these parts that would require, you know, master level machinist knowledge with these organic shapes and these thin features, you know, in just a few hours. Iterating on parts, like I mentioned, you know, I can, I can print multiple different designs on one print bed. I can have them ready to test that same week. Machine shop bottlenecks, you know, we're, this is allowing us to take, you know, manufacturing into our own hands. We have a machine that's now going to run around the clock, not just during business hours, allowing us to take some burden off of our already existing machines. So a little bit about, you know, so I've, I've reviewed a little bit of the challenges, how we solve those challenges, but why should education teach additive manufacturing? at all you know so when it comes to education you know additive manufacturing is a tool that they can use for their existing education but it's also something that a lot of people feel should be actually be taught in universities so 3d printing is really emerging as a key technology so schools that aren't exposing their students to additive manufacturing are really putting them at a severe career disadvantage i know you know here especially at desktop metal but you know we don't really see any uh, you know, almost every student that we see, you know, applying for jobs or internships or co-ops, they're all coming in with some added manufacturing experience, which is, is really important in this day and age, where it's really emerging as a manufacturing technology that is going to be important and is important to know. It also gives students the opportunity to learn and connect these digital tools through actual fabrication. This is true because the fabrication method is just so easy. This is true for plastic printers as well as metal printers. But, you know, you take your CAD class where you're learning, you know, SOLIDWORKS, for example, and you spend all this time modeling parts, but it's very rare for you actually to, to get to fabricate those parts, to actually see those parts. So with a printer now, you know, it's very easy to, to teach a student how to use it. So now they can actually connect these, you know, finite element analysis tools, these generative design tools that they're learning, and actually take them into the, you know, from the digital world into the physical world. You know, and then of course, we can now teach students to start thinking about additive manufacturing as a way to produce these geometries that are just unachievable with traditional manufacturing methods. And we'll look at some parts today that are examples of that. So I hope I've convinced you now, you know, why universities should actually teach additive manufacturing, but why should they choose desktop metal? So desktop metal is really emerging as one of the market leaders. You know, we, you want your students to be familiar with the technology and products that are going to be most common in the workplace. So as they're looking to get hired after, you know, they finish their schooling, you know, companies are able to see that they have, you know, they have experience with the technology that they already own. You know, our products also, as I mentioned, are built around accessibility. This makes it easy, affordable to install desktop metal machines, and they're designed with the end user in mind, making them extremely easy to teach, extremely easy to learn, and extremely easy to operate really making it very simple for your students to get up and running, printing these incredibly complex metal parts uh, very easily and very affordably. We've been shipping systems around the world for a few years now. Uh, you know, we're shipping in over 49 countries. So wherever you're watching today, we have a partner nearby, we have systems nearby, uh, you know, and we're shipping to, you know, a wide variety of different companies and different industries. And, you know, what I want you to take away from this slide is, you know, I'm sure, you know, your eyes are drawn to some of these big names like Toyota and Google. But like I mentioned earlier, 
the system is targeting accessibility. It's targeting the everyday engineer, the everyday manufacturer. So while it's adding value at, you know, to some of the largest companies in the world, it's also being utilized by some of these very small companies that you, you would have never heard of. You know, these mom and pop machine shops, the one or two man manufacturers or the small design agencies. You know, the system's really adding value across the board from the, you know, the large company, the largest companies in the world that have been using 3D printing for, you know, decades now to some of the small companies that are getting their hands on their first 3D printer. You know, really targeting accessibility. The system, these systems are really designed for everyone. But of course, today we're going to be talking about education. You know, these are just a few of our the universities that are, are you know utilizing this technology today, and you know being very successful with it. And you know, of course, both here in the U.S. as well as abroad in Europe and in Asia. So let's start by talking about the Studio System, which is the printer that I have behind me here today. We'll start with talking about how does it work. The studio systems really are office-friendly metal 3D printer. Three pieces of equipment, you see the printer in the middle, the D-binder on the right, and the furnace on the left. Before I start talking about how the studio system works, I briefly need to talk about how metal injection molding works. Metal injection molding is a powdered metal process. It enables you to create these very complex metal parts by utilizing these inexpensive metal powders. It has widely accepted and validated standards, ASTM and ISO standards. It's used across almost every industry you can think of, from consumer products to aerospace, medical device industry, firearm industry. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great technology, allowing you to create a wide variety of parts from a wide variety of different materials, you know, stainless steels, alloy steels, even copper and titanium. The way that metal injection molding works, which is what we're seeing on top here, and, and it's important that you understand metal injection molding first, because the desktop metal products kind of stand on the shoulders of metal injection molding. We kind of take away the pain points of metal injection molding. So with metal injection molding, you start with a powder feedstock, which is this, this inexpensive uh, metal powder, and you mix that with a binder. That binder is similar to a glue, and that's gonna create what, uh, your feedstock. It's this loose feedstock, and you know, normally in a pellet form, actually. We're then gonna eject that feedstock into a mold, similar to how you would in plastic injection molding to create the shape of your part. That part, when it comes out of the mold, is only being held together by that binder material. You know, our, our metal powder is, is still you know, in powder form. We then move to a D binder. That's gonna remove most of that binder, that glue-like material out of the part. And then we're gonna put our part into the furnace. The furnace is gonna get just below the melting temperature of the material. It's gonna remove that last bit of binder and diffusion is going to happen. Our, medical, our, our metal powder is actually going to bond together and create a strong, dense metal part. So metal injection molding is great, but the problem with this technology is the tooling step. You know, for each different part you're going to create, you need a different mold. You're going to need these steel molds that had to be CNC machined with a wire DM, with a wire DM pass for each different geometry. So, you know, if I want to create, you know, this little gear, uh, you know, today and then tomorrow i want to create this adapter you know i need a different i need a different mold for each of these so that's going to create you know which really makes this technology only applicable for high volume because you know the cost of the molds is quite high as well as the lead time is quite high so you would never you know use this method for producing one to you know even hundred thousand parts ten thousand parts depending on the part geometry of course but the studio system works in a very similar way but we remove that pain point of tooling so our feedstock, you know, all of this is going to be targeted around accessibility. You know, the, the sewer system is really targeting accessibility. So rather than having this loose metal feedstock that's, you know, kind of dangerous to work with, it's a loose powder that you have to worry about respiration, uh, we're going to create a feedstock in the form of a rod. That rod's fully encased in a wax to ensure that you're never exposed to any powder. Rather than injecting that rod into a mold, we're simply going to print it. We're going to print that rod layer by layer, building up to what we call a green part. You know, so we don't need the tool anymore. I simply load my file. We're gonna print that same combination of metal powder and the binder layer by layer. And you know, tonight when that part finishes, I can upload a different file and we can print that one. You know, no tooling involved, making it very easy to produce parts in low volume. Then we're gonna do that similar deep binding step. We're gonna remove about 80% of the binder in our process. And then we go into the furnace for the sintering step. We're gonna remove that last bit of binder, get just below the melting temperature of the materials and actually sinter the part. And as you can see here, you know, I have some studio parts with me. You know, these are strong, dense metal parts at the end of the process. This is, uh, this is some steel I have in my hands. So, like I mentioned, three pieces of equipment, printer, similar to the safest, most widely used 3D printing process, FDM. 
which means it has familiar familiar design guidelines, you know, office safe materials, so there's no powder handling involved at any point during the process. D-binder, again, targeting accessibility. It has this low emission design, automatic fluid distillation and recycling. It's safe for your office environment. The parts go into the D-binder dry, they come out of the D-binder dry, meaning at no point during the process are you exposed to any D-mine fluid. Fur furnace, it's really the first office-friendly sintering furnace. It's gonna fit through your office doorway. It's very easy to install and get up and running. It has a peak temperature of 1400 degrees Celsius, allowing you to sinter a wide variety of alloys to the highest densities possible. So what's the result of this process? We're getting what we call a near net shape part. Uh, we have resolution, accuracy, surface finish that's quite similar to casting. Uh, dimensional capabilities, capabilities of about plus or minus 0.8%. Uh, important to know, you know, I'll show you some of these parts in, in a little bit higher detail, but it's important to know that you know, after, after sintering is complete, these parts can be post-processed the same way you would any part. So for example, on this gear that I have here, you know, I needed a tighter tolerance on this inner diameter than what we could get out of the furnace. I needed better than that plus or minus 0.8%. So what did I do? I threw it onto the lathe. I simply turned down this last half a millimeter on that inner diameter. And you know, now I have that critical dimension that I need. It's much, much, much easier for me to simply turn down half a, half a millimeter of that diameter than for me to machine this entire part out of a wrought 17-4 stainless steel. I, I could never do that, actually. It's well above my machining knowledge. So important to know, you know, these parts, of course, are fully functional out of the furnace. But if you do need, you know, a higher tolerance or, you know, a better surface finish, it's, they're fully compatible with, you know, traditional post-processing as well as traditional finishing. You know, for example, you can see, you know, this part's been tumbled in an abrasive media to give it that shiny look uh, that you're seeing here. Let me show you an, another part a little bit, you know, more in detail, just to, to, so you can see a part that's, uh, you know, this is right out of the furnace, what the parts look like here. Let me try to show you. So, you know, you, you can see some layer lines, but, you know, I actually would consider this, you know, uh, uh, a high quality casting. It, it's, it's probably a little bit better than a casting actually, but, you know, cool. Uh, materials, you know, we're working with, you know, like I mentioned before, familiar materials to engineers, 17-4 stainless steel, a very common uh, stainless steel has excellent mechanical properties. Uh, 316L, another common stainless steel, a little bit better at higher temperatures under some specific corrosion environments. Alloy 625, also known as Inconel, excellent at high temperatures as well as some specific corrosion environments. H13 tool steel, known for its excellent hot hardness, which allows it to, you know, it's great, it's a great material for constantly fluctuating temperatures, which makes it perfect for injection molding cores that are gonna be constantly being heated and cooled. Uh, 4140, known for its excellent hardness values, makes it an excellent material for you know things like end effectors, uh, sheet metal tooling, you know housings, for example. And then you have your copper, your high purity copper, which is excellent for those thermal and electrical conductivity applications. So, quick recap on the studio system: you know, really targeting accessibility. This office-friendly metal 3D printer. You know, there's no hazardous powders at any point during the process, which means you don't need respirators. There's no dangerous lasers that are involved at any point during the process. Uh, you don't need any dedicated operators. There's no load supports. I'll quickly show you this actually. The printer actually has uh, two uh, extruders. One's gonna be printing your metal material and one's gonna be printing an uh, interface layer that's similar to a ceramic. So for example, you know, your, your parts need to be supported in the furnace to ensure that you know, the parts are shrinking uniformly. Uh, so for example, you know, this is the support structure here. In between the support structure and the part, we're gonna place a layer of ceramic. The ceramic has a much higher sintering temperature than the metal material does, so that that's gonna ensure that you know, there's no metal actually touching metal on the support. So that ensures that after sintering, we can simply just lift our part right up off the supports, greatly simplifying post-processing. Uh, I know that the support layer is a little bit, it can be a little bit hard to follow, but you can imagine you know, all of this, uh, wherever your, your support would be touching your part, you're gonna have that ceramic layer to ensure that our part never centers to uh, the support. And then no special facilities required. It's very easy to get the system installed up and running in, you know, in an office environment. So let's look at some applications. Starting with roller screws. So this is a, uh, you know, a roller screw linear actuator. It's used uh, for opening and closing a pilot valve actually in a steam power plant. Uh, originally this part was manufactured out of 
uh, five different components and then assemble. So, but with 3D printing, you know, now we're able to actually just consolidate it into one simple assembly uh, that, you know, was far too expensive and difficult before. Uh, this part was able to be produced on the studio system for $86, takes about four days. Uh, CNC machining alternative was about $1,900, taking about two weeks. And you can see here, the original design actually was seven parts. You know, those gears were produced separately, uh, had some set screws as well as some like lock tighting. But now we're able to actually just consolidate that entire part into one component and print it all together like you're seeing here. It's a fun part. It's actually, uh, you know, a senior design project that a team worked on. Uh, motor mount. Uh, I don't have this part with me here today, but you know, as you're working on different, you know, projects, you know, as a student, you know, it's very common to have to use different motors for different assemblies, you know, different machines you're working on. So different motor mounts are often required. Uh, you know, this is a motor mount for a NEMA motor. Uh, you know, it would have required actually multiple different CNC setups, making it, you know, beyond the ability of the students uh, that designed it. You know, so this part was able to be produced for just $56, took about four days to send it out of house to be in CNC machine. It was going to cost about $245 and take two to three weeks. So, you know, over 90% less more affordable and four times faster than the alternative sending it out of house. Uh, custom mechanical coupling. This part I do have with me here today. Um, you know, these of course are used for transferring uh, rotational power between, you know, two, you know, a, a motor and, you know, some other piece that's going to be rotating a gear, for example. You know, generally you buy your couplings off the shelf, but occasionally you do need these custom couplings. So, you know, this, this part actually features some quite, uh, some quite fine geometry that, as you can see, uh, so these parts are actually able to be prototyped originally on the studio system because we can print, you know, a set of these for about $32, taking about four days, and then, you know, move to higher volume on the shop system, costing about $21, and you can do about 750 sets per week. So you can see, you know, the shop system really is moving to that higher volume of, you know, thousands of parts where studio system is really good for that prototyping uh, stage. I'm not sure how well this is coming across on the overhead camera here, but I hope you can see these parts in a little bit more detail. Uh, motion stage flexure. Uh, you know, these parts are used for actually adding compliance uh, to, uh, you know, these are used to add compliance over a small predictable range. Uh, this one actually is used for a ball screw in a motion stage. You know, this would be attached to the, uh, the motion stage. This is a, the ball screw here to allow just to add a little bit of compliance to ensure that there's, if they're slightly askew, that it's not going to bind or cause any unnecessary wear. Uh, you know, if this flexure here features some, you know, very thin walls, as you can see here. Uh, so this would be incredibly difficult to machine. You know, this actually moves up and down. That's what the flexure does to, to add that compliance. Uh, this would be incredibly difficult to machine because there'd be lots of chatter and vibration uh, during the process. But, you know, it's, it's relatively easy for us just to print uh, this flexure component. This part uh, was, is able to be printed for about $41, takes about four days. Uh, on the shop system, about $39. We do about 532 of these uh, per week. So another great example, the CNC alternative again, would have had to have been sent out of house, cost about $210 to produce, and take about two to three weeks uh, to get that part. Uh, this BattleBot component, I'm not so sure how many of you are familiar with the show BattleBots, but it's a show on the Discovery Channel where you have these very cool fighting robots. Uh, a, a student team uh, enters into this competition every year, and one of the parts they needed was this uh, backstop. So this part actually holds uh, the saw arm of the of the battle on the battle bot. You know, it's a very structural member. It must resist these extremes bending and lateral motions. Uh, they wanted to use this relatively complex geometry because they want to keep the strength to weight uh, very, very high. The team only has about a month to build this entire robot, so lead time is very critical here. Uh, so being able to print this part in just four days for $56 was a huge advantage to them. The part functioned flawlessly. If you're ever watching uh, Discovery Channel, I would be sure to look uh, for this part. Uh, it's, it's, or look for Saw Blaze is the name of the robot. Uh, this part is 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 on the is on saw blaze. Uh, a heat exchanger. So I, this is a this is a copper component that I have here. Um, this part actually features a conformal cooling channel as well. So as you can see, you know I have an inlet and an outlet here on the part 
that's where you know we're going to hook up our, our water our inlet and our water outlet uh, and that water is actually going to snake down through the part to keep this uh, heat exchanger at an optimal uh, at an optimal performance you can see the fins on the outside of the part as well you know to, to increase that heat exchange uh, surface area to allow this part to you know pulling lots of heat out of the part you know it's used for cooling some fluids you know since they decided that they were going to manufacture this part uh, via 3d printing you know they were able to really optimize the design of this part you know by you know they're able to incorporate that internal cooling channel they're able to incorporate these internal and external fins that would be very difficult and expensive to, ma to machine uh, and to, to produce this optimized part you know, of course, copper is going to give us that excellent thermal conductivity we need and want for a heat exchanger to allow this part to perform flawlessly. Uh, this part can be printed for about $443. Uh, takes about four days. Uh, and the CNC alternative was about $2,100. And that's without that internal cooling channel because, of course, it's not possible to machine that cooling channel. It can only be 3D printed. You should be able to see here, you know, you can see it actually being printed into the part. The internal channels were designed in a teardropping shape to ensure that no supports were needed inside of there. Uh, you can see the final part, you know, on the two of them here on the print bed, and then the final part uh, after sintering. Uh, impellers. Uh, different impellers are often desirable, you know, depending on, you know, the pumping scenario that's going to be involved, depending on, you know, the head pressures and the flow rates you want to achieve. And often the way you, you, you alter that is through these veins. Uh, these veins, though, are very difficult and very expensive to machine. You know, they're quite thin. They feature some organic shapes on them. Uh, so, you know, 3D printing of these is, is, is a great application. Uh, the, the impeller A up there, you know, that was produced out of 316L. Uh, that's just a general pumping impeller but you want that 316L for that corrosion resistance. Impeller B, which is the one I have with me here, this is used in an oil and gas environment, actually. Uh, this was produced out of Inconel or Alloy 625 for its excellent heat and corrosion resistance. Uh, the top impeller there was produced for about $53, taking about four days. And impeller B, the one I have here, about $230, taking five days. Uh, shock absorber pistons. So this is a good example of, you know, some prototyping, uh, you know, different shock pistons are desirable uh, for, to produce damping and reduce bounce and shock in a, in a shock assembly. You know, you have your spring, then you have your damper, which is the piston here to remove energy out of that system. Uh, they have these relatively complex shapes and internal channels to actually direct the flow of the shock fluid away from, you know, to, to, to provide that damping. And with 3D printing here, we're actually able to try a lot of different designs because I can test all of these different shock pistons on one print bed. I can print them in just about a day, and then I'm ready to iterate, you know, and, and, and test them out that same week. Studio System uh, can produce these for about $73 each, takes about four days. Uh, the CNC alternative, if possible, some of them actually feature channels that are impossible to, uh, impossible to, uh, to uh to print so that those ones you know of course couldn't be cnc machined about four hundred dollars takes about two weeks uh custom heat sink uh this is a, a heat sink that attaches to a motor uh you know of course again we're using copper for that excellent thermal uh conductivity uh this actually by printing this part we allow this heat sink to perfectly conform to the shape of the motor this allows heat to be more efficiently be pulled from the motor. And again, machining of these tall, thin features is extremely challenging due to the chattering of the fins that are being cut. You know, these are quite thin, they're quite tall, so they would be, you know, a lot of vibration and a lot of chatter in those fins. Copper, again, optimal choice uh, and excellent for this low volume. This part can be produced for about $78, takes about four days. The CNC alter alternative, you know, machining of copper is quite difficult because it's also quite a gummy material. Uh, about $1,200 takes about two weeks. Uh, another part here is this atomizer. So this is a project that was actually to uh, increase the fuel efficiency uh, for steam propulsion boilers on a liquid natural gas tanker. You can see the baseline atomizer here. It's a very simple design, just you know, just you know, some circles with with uh, some holes cut in it. And what this atomizer actually does is it mixes steam and fuel in a burner to actually you know, propel this ship. The problem with this baseline atomizer is that it gets very, very, very poor fuel efficiency uh, during, uh, when it's, during low load, which means you know, when the ship is going slowly, when it's maneuvering around port, when it's uh, just putzing around, it gets very poor fuel efficiency. So the team was tasked with how do we increase 
the fuel efficiency of this ship. Uh, one way that they did this was through uh, design, you know, design iterations with, with 3D print, with metal 3D printing. Uh, you can see a couple different design iterations they have here and utilizing, uh, you know, metal out of manufacturing, they very quickly realized that by altering the, by altering the, you know, the actual shape of the, of the, of the channel, you can see the couple different shapes of the channel, as well as some of the curvature and as, as well as some of the internal channels shaping throughout that part, they're able to greatly increase the mixing of, uh, you know, that fuel and that steam to allow for a better uh, performance of the atomizer. You can see, you know, some of the journey to the final design here where they're, you're, they're testing different iterations, they're prototyping different iterations, and you can see the final part, which is the one that I have with me here today. Uh, this part was produced out of 316L stainless steel uh, for its excellent mechanical properties at high temperatures. Since this is a burner component, it's going to have that high temperature uh, and that high heat, as well as some corrosion and resistance for those uh, marine environments. Uh, with 3D printing, you know, the atomizer was able to be drastically improved about a 67% improvement in the fuel mixing, which led to a customer fuel savings of between $90,000 to $160,000 annually. Part was produced on the studio system for just $300, taking about five days. And you can see, you know, some of these oddly shaped holes in the top here, uh, as well as, you know, there's actually some, you know, each of these holes is for either fuel or uh, steam. And you can see that, you know, those channels actually snake up through the part into these uh, top holes here. And you can see it actually burning here. So you can imagine, you know, this is a part that needs to be created out of metal and 316L is an excellent material for that. All right, let's jump over to fiber. Fiber is our composite printer, you know, printing lots of great parts. Let's talk briefly about how it works. Fiber is going to print parts. We commonly like to say that are stronger than steel and lighter than aluminum printed at your desktop. And I'm going to justify that statement to you in these next couple of slides. But it really allows you to create these very, very strong parts in a wide different range of materials and making it extremely accessible to everyone, you know, in, both in terms of cost of the machine as well as ease of use. So fiber is going to, you know, create, combines the benefits of continuous fiber with the ease of 3D printing. So we're using these high strength continuous fiber tapes that I'll, that I'll, that I'll talk about more in a minute uh, with this excellent surface finish as well because we're using these strong top fiber filaments, you know, having this very, very easy software workflow. We're going to use these advanced composite materials such as Peak or PEC that are great for high strength and temperature and chemical resistance. And then again, affordable and flexible. Pricing starts at, at $3,500 a year and then you can upgrade that system at any time to new models. And again, you know, the, the reason for the subscription is we see a lot of people, especially with the more affordable systems that, you know, they're, they're iterating so quickly that, you know, mach machines get outdated very quickly. So with this price per year, you know, you have the ability to upgrade at any time or even send it back at any time. So that way you're never stuck with any outdated, uh, outdated equipment. So let's look at the part anatomy of, uh, of a system. So the system has two print heads. The first print head is a nozzle, which is very similar to your traditional uh, FDM 3D printing nozzle, you know, like a glue gun, just printing layer by layer. That nozzle is going to be printing a filament that's made out of a chopped fiber material. So it's going to be either a nylon, a peak, or a peck with chopped up carbon fiber inside of that part. So on our sliced view over here on the right, you know, everything that's orange and gray is all being printed with that nozzle. Then we have a second print head. That print head is going to be, it's more of like a tape head actually. It's printing these continuous fiber tapes. They're three millimeter wide, they're continuous strands of carbon fiber, and they're incred incredibly strong. So we use those to reinforce the part. So if you think of, uh, if, you're, you know, if you're familiar with concrete and rebar, you can think of your concrete as being printed with your, your nozzle, and then the rebar is you know, our tapes here. We're really reinforcing the part with these strong tapes you know, that we're running throughout throughout the throughout the part. Uh, these tapes are incredibly strong and we're only placing them where we need to add strength and then we can add lots of detail with the nozzle. So in this example here, you know, everything that you're seeing ghosted out, that would be printed with the nozzle. That's that FFF material. And then the second print head that's laying down those tapes is everything that you're seeing in gray here. Uh, that's, uh, you know, those continuous fiber tapes where we're kind of reinforcing this yoke. 
Uh, the tapes are then actually laid in multiple different directions. Uh, there are these automated fiber placement tapes that are incredibly strong. And by laying them in different directions, we're able to get our part strength, you know, around, you know, a variety of different directions. So looking at the materials, we have what you're seeing in purple here on the left. Those are our filaments. That's what's being printed by the nozzle. So you can see, for example, you know, the PA6 nylon uh, with the carbon fiber, that's about 63 megapascals intensive tension. ABS is about 39, so it's, it's already quite an increase. And if you go up to the peak or PEC, we can get up over 100, which is still, you know, it's, it's quite impressive. Looking at the densities, you know, we're about 1.17, 1.35. So you look at aluminum, we're, we're about half of what, you know, aluminum is in terms of density. So that's that first nozzle where we're printing, you know, fine details and things like that. Then looking at our continuous fiber tapes. Those are those three millimeter strips of tape that are quite long uh, that, are, that are rolled into your part to reinforce it. So the nylon uh, or, the, or the fiberglass, uh, with nylon with fiberglass or nylon with carbon fiber, you know, 1400 megapascals, 900 megapascals. If you go up to peak or, or PEC in carbon fiber, 2400 megapascals. Steel is about, 4140 steel is about 655. So almost four times the strength of steel uh, in tension with these continuous fiber tapes. So that's where we get this statement of stronger than steel. Then if we go down and look at the densities of these materials, you know, 1.45, 1.57 grams per centimeter cubed. You know, aluminum is about 2.7. So we're about half of that. So that's where we get our lighter than aluminum. So as you can understand, you know, this allows you to create some incredibly strong parts uh, you know, all with a lot of ease because we're just printing it. You know, I have a printer actually over here in the corner. You know, you print it in ease on your desktop very easily and very quickly. So let's look at some applications of the fiber printer. Uh, the motor housing, you know, this is the part that I have here. This is another one of those BattleBots components. This part's actually used to hold an electric motor in place on the robot. You know, during competition, it's obviously very, very hectic, very, very rugged. So the part needs to be able to withstand some high loading, high heat from flamethrowers and things of that, of that nature. Uh, this part was able to be printed for just $64. It takes about 10, uh, 10 hours to print this part. So very, very easy to produce this incredibly strong part. Custom brackets. Each bracket that's on the screen here was printed in less than one hour. As you can imagine, you know, in education, you know, as we're incorporating different sensors, bearings, shafts, motors, etc., you know, we need these, we need these brackets. So now we can produce these incredibly strong brackets that we may have had to machine out of aluminum before in just, you know, in just an hour. So, you know, I can almost design my part in the morning. I can throw it on the printer during lunch and I come back from lunch and my bracket is ready to be installed onto our machine, allowing us to greatly, you know, it's, it's a huge advantage, especially for students. Uh, this is a component of a wheelchair. Uh, this is actually a lever-powered wheelchair, so you have two levers in your arms that you push uh, to a drivetrain that's actually going to propel you forward. Uh, the part was traditionally machined out of aluminum, requiring a couple week lead time, but there was some desirability to be, you know, more customized to produce parts in lower volume. So, you know, these ones were produced out of uh, nylon mixed with fiberglass for about twelve dollars and sixty-seven cents each, and it can print, you know, you can print each one of these in just twelve hours. So, you know, very, very quick, very to produce these incredibly strong parts. A curling whip. This is a part that's used, uh, you know, to actually for adaption of curling uh, for athletes with disabilities for the paraplegic games, uh, paraplympic games. Uh, and, you know, this is assembled to the end of the stick and is used to actually push the part, you know, it needs to be incredibly strong and incredibly stiff because, you know, it's, it's transferring the power from the stick into the actual curling uh, ball. Material costs here, you know, just $11.24. We're producing this part with nylon and fiberglass. You can print each of these in just seven hours. Uh, radio housing, this is a part that I have with me here today. I'll show you this part in a little bit of detail because it's a great example of some of that high uh, resolution surface finish you can get. You, you know, these parts actually almost, they almost look like they're, uh, you know, injection molded. Incredibly, uh, some incredible surface finish, incredibly smooth. Uh, surfaces but this is a part that's actually used on an ultra high frequency it's used to hold an ultra high, ultra high frequency radio uh on a cubesat uh it has a lot of you know some fine features it has some quite complex geometry so it was an ideal for for printing uh printed out of PEC actually because of the extreme temperatures of space uh, needed that you know material as well as the outgassing requirements and esd compliance as well uh pr this cut part costs about 60 dollars takes about 21 hours to print uh, but it, you know, allows you to create this incredibly complex part in just, you know, less than a day. 
uh, rocket fin. I have one of these with me here as well. Uh, you know, this is a this is an experimental rocket fin for some testing that was being done. You know, specifically designed for a specific rocket, and then you know, altering the the different geometries and different you know different radiuses and things of that nature here to allow for different testing of this part. It can be printed for just twenty-two dollars and forty-seven cents in about three hours. This is made at a peak as well because you know, of course, you know this rocket's going to be experiencing some very high uh, loading as well as temperatures. Uh, rocket tail cone, you know, a similar application. You know, this is added. I'll actually switch my camera back. This is kind of a larger part. Uh, this is added to the bottom of a rocket to ensure, you know, optimal airflow, less drag on the component. You know, 3D printing actually removes some of the traditional manufacturing constraints, enable them to create this awesome uh, tail cone, allowing the rockets to reach, you know, some higher altitudes and higher speeds. Again, printed at a peak in carbon fiber due to its excellent specific strength, excellent thermal properties. Uh, this part costs about $300 can be printed in just 31 hours. So let's talk a little bit about binder jetting. We have two binder jetting systems. We have the shop system, which is really our binder jetting system that's designed specifically for machine shops. And then we have the production system, which is really the world's fastest metal 3D printer. How does binder jetting work? As you can imagine, binder jetting works by jetting binder. Uh, we have, this is a powdered metal process. So you have a powder feed box on the right and that's holding those low cost metal injection molding powders. We're gonna spread a thin layer of that powder across the build box, just about 50 microns thick. And then we have a, a print head that's gonna come across and jet binder onto that, you know, that layer of powder. So we're only gonna be laying down binder you know, in this example, our parts are our jigsaw puzzle pieces. We're only going to lay down binder where our part is going to be. You know, that binder is going to then, you know, hold that powder together to create the shape of our part. You know, after one layer is printed, we're going to lower the build box again, spread another layer of powder, and then the print is going to come across again, jetting that binder to, you know, just on that layer of that part. Uh, by printing like this, you know, we can print an entire layer of parts in just a few seconds. Cause that printhead's gonna move all the way across the build box very quickly, you know, move back, spread another layer of powder very, very quickly to produce, you know, very, very quickly to produce parts. After the print process is complete, we're gonna remove that entire build box out of the printer. We're gonna depowder all of our parts, pull out our parts that are still only held together by that binder material. And we're gonna put the parts into the furnace. The furnace is gonna, you know, do that thermal debinding. There is no solvent debind in this process. We're gonna reach a thermal debind temperature that's gonna remove uh, that binder out of our part, get up to the sintering temperatures, and actually sinter the part into a strong, dense uh, metal part. And I have uh, quite a few binder jetting parts with me here today. We actually have hundreds of them, thousands of them, uh, just in this cabinet right next to me. But just a few of the parts, uh, uh, we, you know, they're very high resolution, uh, nice, strong, dense metal parts. Uh, this system really allows you to have this much, much higher productivity and throughput. If you look at this build box on the right here, you can see all the different geometries that we're able to print together in one build. You know, all of these parts to be machined would require different setups, different programming, tons of machinist time, you know, as well as different fixturing. Uh, but you know, now we can just, we can put, we can design that entire build in one to two hours, throw it on the printer overnight. We have all those different geometries in just a few days. And the real important thing is, is that we're doing mass production now without the need for tooling. This means that you know if, if a customer sends me a part today, I can throw it on the printer you know that 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 night, and we can have you know parts out to that customer in just a couple of days, <laughs> all without the need for tooling. Uh, and then of course you know if I need to make a change to my design, all I have to do is change my CAD file, upload it back to the printer, and I'm ready to go. You can see you know just some more examples of components. Uh, the sensor holder. So this is the part that I have here. This is used to hold multiple different sensors. Uh, in place uh, during to take some measurements in a machine. The small detailed features of this part make it ideal uh, for the shop system. Uh, printing resulting in an extreme reduction in both manufacturing lead time as well as the part costs here. It also allows us for some flexible manufacturing, right? Because if I need to make changes to the design to incorporate different sensors, all I have to do is send a revised file and I can have a couple hundred of them that same week. This part, you know, costs about $7.80. We can do about 186 of these per build or 1,500 of them per week. The clipper blade, as you can imagine, you know, this is used for clipping hair. But you can see some of the, the very fine, I'll see if that focuses, some of the very fine details on this component. Uh, 
Traditionally, this is made via stamping or metal injection molding requiring very expensive tooling. But you know, to mass produce this part on the shop system, you know, again, we're eliminating that need for tooling, reducing, reducing part costs, dramatically reducing manufacturing lead time. Uh, this part can be produced for just $5.74 on the shop system. You can do 684 of them per build and about almost 5,000 of them per week. So really unlocking the potential to do mass production uh, with binary jetting. Cool parts. Uh, bearing housing. So this example is really almost exclusively around lead time. So this is a this is a part that holds some press fit bearings into place, and the team really needed this part quickly and out of steel. So rather than having to go to a machine shop that's going to have to set up fixturing to set up uh, you know different manufacturing environments, they're now able just to print this part in just a few days. They're able to print all the components they needed and you know, get them on, installed into their machine in less than a week, requiring almost no operator labor. Uh, this part can be printed for about $73, about 25 of them per build, can do about 192 of them per week. Uh, so just a, a huge example of just the speed and flexibility of the shop system. I wanna briefly talk about generative design before we wrap everything up here, because you know, this is something that you know, more and more people are teaching and learning in universities and in school and education because generative design is really gonna allow people to create these highly, highly, highly optimized components. So generative design is gonna place material only where it's needed to result in these dramatically optimized components. These parts generally are featuring these very organic shapes though that are extremely difficult to manufacture, especially using traditional manufacturing methods. 3D printing excels at manufacturing these parts though because it's adding material layer by layer allowing us to create these complex parts. It's really the ultimate example of designing a part for its application and not its manufacturing method. So one part that Desktop Metal uh, worked on with generative design is this, you know, this project, which was to marry a 2001 BMW M3 with a modern V8 engine. As you can imagine, a lot of the parts didn't fit together from the original engine and this new car. So what did they do? Uh, they took this original engine mount, they scanned it up, and loaded it into a generative design software. You can see all the blue planes here are what we call keep out zones. That's where it's telling the part, do not come here, do not, do not grow here. If you come here, you're going to interfere with part of the engine. You know, then we allow the software to choose where do you wanna put material, where do you wanna grow, after we you know, add loading and mounting scenarios to allow the part to really just be designed by the computer. You can see a couple different iterations of the part here. You can see one of those parts in the engine actually. Uh, with some Sharpie on it being told, you know, we need to make some adjustments here. And then you can see the final results here printed on the desktop metal studio system. And you can see, you know, that very, very organic shape of this part, you know, these weird curvatures that would be just a nightmare or impossible to machine, but are very easy for us just to simply print them layer by layer. This part was actually too big to fit on the print bed of the studio system. So it was actually printed in two different parts and then welded together. And you can see just that weld line here. You can see it actually in the engine here, holding it to the frame of the car. As you can imagine, that engine is extremely heavy and this car is gonna be driving very fast. So it would need to be steel to hold up that, you know, that weight of that engine. Another part uh, is this shaker hook. This shaker hook is used for harvesting nuts and olives. It can collect about 3000 kilograms of olives per day with a falling rate of 95%. So that means it gets 95% of the fruit off the tree without damaging the tree or any of its buds. Uh, it's a key component, so the design significantly impacts its performance, its reliability, and its usability. Uh, the original of these parts were produced via an aluminum chill casting operation. Uh, of course, you know, that's not applicable for low volume because, you know, casting in general is generally for higher volumes. It requires tooling, it requires a foundry setup, and it's quite difficult logistically. So this company is, is Cifarelli, actually. They get some, uh, they get some, you know, some needs to be producing parts in low volume. So what do they do? They look to their studio system. The studio system is gonna allow them to create these parts in low volume with, you know, not a lot of increasing costs or any increasing costs. But the parts were aluminum, originally created in aluminum and the studio system does not print aluminum. So they needed to now move to steel, but they didn't want the part to be any heavier because they didn't want any, you know, unnecessary wear on the gearbox, on the rest of the, of the motor example. So they needed to keep the part light, as light as the original aluminum. So how did they do this? They turned to generative design to optimize the geometry. You know, that you can see they load the original part into the, into the software, they apply some loading, that frequency of the part shaking up and down, and they end up with a part 
that is, you know, very much lightweighted and is no heavier than the original aluminum part, but it's actually stronger because now we're leveraging that strength of steel. You can see, you know, the, the sintered shaker hooks after printing and sintering here, uh, they're ready to be installed onto the actual shaker. And you can see them here actually installed onto the shaker, shaking this branch, uh, you know, ready to go. Just another great example of generative design to allow the software to, you know, for example, you know, just allow us to create a part that's stronger than the aluminum component, but actually lighter because we, we use generative design. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate you taking you know this hour out of your day to join me and talk a little bit about 3D printing. Uh, I'd love to explore what metal 3D printing can do for, you, for your company, for your business. I'd love to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, with me or one of my colleagues and you to talk a little bit about your parts, your projects, to see if any of our, you know, any of our systems could be a good fit for you. I'm happy to give you a free part assessment. If you want to send me over some CAD files, I'm happy to you know, review them, let you know if I think they'd be good parts for the process, whether or not, you know, how much they're going to cost, what the throughput is going to be of those components on the different systems, and of course, get you a free part sample if this is something that you're interested in. Uh, no pressure, of course. You know, these, are, these are very casual meetings. I love just to hear about you know, your environments, how, how you're making use of metal 3D printing, or how, how you think you can do metal 3D printing, and I'm happy to advise you on on if I think any of the products could be a good fit. Uh, thanks so much. We're gonna be doing a lot of these webinars, so feel free to head over to our website to sign up for more. Maybe you wanna do a deep dive on fiber, studio, shop, production. Uh, you know, you wanna hear more about material properties or you wanna hear more about, you know, part finishing, for example. We're gonna be doing tons of these webinars, so feel free to sign up for more of them. I'm, I'd love to chat with all of you again. And of, of course, you know, here's my email, ethan at desktopmetal.com. Feel free to shoot me an email if you have any thoughts, questions, comments. I'm happy to chat with anyone here or answer any questions or, or look at any of your parts. All right. Thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate you taking time on your day to join me. I hope this was helpful and I hope you learned something. Thanks.